Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Project Endure Podcast. It is episode 15. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very special guest down in Texas, Chris Piontek. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Of course. It's a pleasure. We, uh, we've connected for a while now just through Instagram primarily. Uh, it's one of those things where you support me, I support you. We send encouragement each other's way and we've been doing that for a while. And it's really cool to just sit down face to face while well, over Zoom and, uh, and connect. And you know, I know a little bit about your story, but I felt like you would be a great fit for what this podcast stands for. And before we jump into kind of the, the deep stuff, I figured, why don't you just introduce yourself to the listeners? Okay. Well, obviously my name is Chris. Uh, I live in San Antonio currently. Um, right now I'm going to school through uh, the army, getting two master's degrees. One's MBA and the other's an MHA, which is healthcare admin. Um, but a little bit about me. I'm from Seattle originally. I uh, joined the army when I was 18, uh, enlisted. I was military police um, and then did a whole bunch of stuff deployed. Um, and then I actually went through the green to gold program. So I went back to college for two years at, a um, at Washington state university and then commissioned in 2015. Um, and I've been an officer since then, um, and medical service corps officer. So I deal with medical operations. And then after I graduate with this degree, uh, be working in the healthcare admin field. So. That's awesome, man. I didn't realize you were from Seattle. What, what brought you down to Texas? Just the military. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now, funny story about the military or just a, a quick aside. When my wife and I went to get our vaccines, uh, COVID vaccines back in March of 2021, there was the National Guard was in town. There was some military uh, at the convention center here in Philadelphia. And we sat down and uh, this guy in full military, you know, outfit sat down next to us and he was preparing the needle and just making small talk. I said, you know, have you, have you guys been doing this for a while? You know, how many shots have you given out? Just trying to make small talk. And he looked at me and he said, no, this is actually my, my first, my first day. And I was like, started sweating a little bit. And I said, oh really? Like, uh, have you given out many shots today? And he goes, no, actually you're my first one. And uh, he was dead serious. And then he let me think that for about a minute. And then he's like, no, nah, I've been, I've been a military, a med, med here in the military for years. So you're good. Um, but yeah, Chris, I mean, I would just kick it off because you're a dad, right? And I would assume that's pretty challenging. You have a uh, 10 month old, I believe as your third child. Is that right? Five months. Five months. Oh man, I was jumping ahead. Tell us a little bit about what fatherhood's like. Oh, I mean, it's wild. It's ups and downs and uh, it's challenging. Uh, it brings out the best and the worst in you all at the same time. Um, and every day is a new adventure. And sometimes your kids wake up and they choose violence and you just got to <laughs> respond with a little grace. Um, but it's the best thing ever. Um, like right before this podcast, um, my daughter wanted to go on a run. So I threw her in the stroller and that's like one of our best times to bond. We just go out and, and I run and she tells me to run faster and she's the best uh, track coach ever. That's awesome. Now, how old are your older two children? So my oldest is five and a half and then my middle child just turned three and then uh, five months. So they're about gotcha. half years apart each. Gotcha. So you've got your hands full. Yes. So now why don't we just jump right into the question? I'm not sure if parenthood is going to play a role in this conversation, but we'll go with whatever comes out of your mouth. Uh, what's the hardest thing or circumstance that you you've ever had to handle as a person? Okay. So uh, thinking about this, uh, I actually think right after I commissioned um, and we were getting stationed, my wife and I, at, at our first duty station as an officer, it was in Hawaii. Uh, and mm -hmm. so just, that doesn't sound that hard. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> the logistics of it are a little bit challenging when you move outside the continental United States because you have to ship your vehicles and all that. Um, so you're without car and without goods for a little while. But um, while we were in the hotel, like the first week we were there, um, my wife found out she was pregnant. And so in the middle of moving and all that, and my wife is going through morning sickness and, and whatnot. And then 
we went from two incomes to now she's pregnant and not feeling well enough to work. So two incomes to one income. Uh, we got all these bills to figure out. I'm trying to learn my job at the same point in time. Um, it, that was certainly very challenging. And I remember having conversations with my wife saying like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Not like marriage, but like career field wise. I was like, I might need to uh, get out and do something different. So um, just working through that. Uh, and I really think that opened up the gates for us to communicate better as a, a couple and reset our priorities. And I really think in the end, it's what we needed. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, that does sound like a lot. My, my Hawaii comment was, was a, a joke, I mean, of course. Yeah. <laughs> where in Hawaii were you guys? We're in Oahu. So um, where we were stationed at Schofield Barracks, which is like the, oh, we'd say it's kind of in the middle, but to the west of the island a little bit. Gotcha. Okay. So let's go back to that moment. Cause I'm really curious, right? You guys find out that your wife is pregnant. Doesn't sound like you're necessarily expecting that. Um, it throws a wrench in your plans financially at the very least. What are some of the gut emotions that are you're feeling in your stomach and what are some of the thoughts that are running through your head? Uh, I'm just really not seeing how the numbers match up to, to make ends meet at that point. Um, having, two car payments and credit cards and all that sort of stuff going on. Um, just trying to figure out how it's all going to work. What can I do extra to, to help out? Um, but luckily, I mean, everything surprisingly worked out in the end. We were able to kind of get the vehicle situation down to a one car family. And we've, we've been doing that ever since and it's worked out wonderfully. Um, but just nervous. Cause then you're, you're thinking like, I want to make sure I have enough to be able to buy my kid everything that they need. And I also don't want to be a burden at work because I'm thinking so much about this other thing. So there's a lot of uh, dynamics there. Yeah. It, it makes me think almost of this story of a Spanish conqueror from the 1500s. Now I promise I'll circle this back and tie it into what, what, what you're talking about. But uh, this guy named Hernan Cortez, which I, that name rung a bell the first time I heard it recently because I learned about him in elementary school, but he took a small army of guys from Spain to the Aztec empire in the early 1500s. And their goal was to take this treasure that had been there for, I think, 600 or so years. And no other army had been able to successfully take the treasure. And so the Aztecs were, were really good at defending this. But when Hernan Cortez and his men got to the island, he apparently told them to burn the boats. And they burned the boats that they came in. And I'm sure, at least I can imagine, if I was one of those guys, I would be one, really upset, and two, very confused. Three, probably extremely scared. And Hernan Cortez explained that if they were going to leave, they were going to leave in the Aztecs' boats. And uh, he essentially took away their safety net. He took away any other option. And it sounds like in your situation, you almost faced something similar where life forced you into a position where you had no other choice but to figure it out. And I'm curious for you, if you can look back now and see that as a positive, or if you look back now and you're still just shaking your head and trying to, trying to figure out how it all worked out. No, I definitely feel like that. And it was just kind of one of those moments where you, you're like, I don't really have any options, right? You just control what you can control, control the controllables. Um, and I really think it was God, you know, testing us like, hey, this is like your first really big test as a married couple. Um, you're going to go to this island and then you're going to have all this stuff. So do you trust me enough to get you through this? And um, I mean, we started going to church and volunteering and that was part of it too. So, um, but really like relationship wise, it, it was like definitely the thing that brought us closest together was working through that challenge. That's cool. Yeah. Struggle has a funny way of doing that, of bringing people closer together. And I guess it can go either way. It can pull people apart or bring people closer together. And it sounds like faith was part of the reason you guys were able to stay close together. And so I'm really curious about that component of things. I mean, is faith something that existed in your life uh, prior to the move to Hawaii and same with your wife? Yeah. Um, so well, growing up childhood, uh, I remember going to church and I know my my parents had volunteered at church a little bit, but by the time um, we were in high school slash um, getting ready to get out of high school, the only time we'd go to church is Christmas, Easter. Um, and then, so 
transitioning to the military. Um, I had my own personal struggles with mental health and um, self mutilation and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what saved me was talking to a chaplain when I was deployed um, and giving my life to God then. It, but funny that, you know, you get back and your life kind of goes back to normal. Um, and then my wife and I had started dating um, and we going to church wasn't part of what we were doing. We, we both believed, um, but we just didn't go together. So um, right before I went to college, uh, we started going to church together. And then when we got to college, we started serving in church together and then moving to Hawaii. That's when we got like really involved in it. So it just kind of evolved. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And now you had mentioned something about when you were talking to the chaplain or right before you talked to the chaplain, it sounds like you were in a tough spot or a dark place. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you looking back at that season of life and understanding how that connects to everything going forward and seeing like, yeah, that, that happened for a reason. And I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. Um, is that how you see it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's ironic because, so I was in a relationship while I was deployed. Um, and the, my, my fiance at the time, her mother actually sent me a book out of the blue and it was the story of David versus Goliath. And it was like, right as I'm going through all this, like all these personal challenges, um, and just reading it, I can remember like, like you got to fight, you got to get through this. Like everybody, equates David and Goliath to their own personal story. But for me, you know, Goliath is overcoming some sort of mental health challenge that I was going through at the time. Um, and it just encouraged me to fight and then fight for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, did your uh, fiance's mother at the time know that you were going through a dark time when she sent you that book? I'm sure she did probably from talking to my fiance, but uh, like I, I maybe met her one time. So yeah. not like I had a relationship. It was just, completely random. Yeah. And the reason I ask is because I think it brings up a really important point for anybody who's listening is just that you never know what action you might take that might absolutely change someone's life in that moment, or at least give them enough hope or encouragement to get through the tough spot that they're stuck in. And the other, the flip side of that is I'm sure, I mean, Chris, looking at you and, and following you on social media, you're an in shape dude, right? you look like you're confident, like you've got it all together. And I'm, I'm guessing back in those days, you were in shape and you were fit and people would probably look at you and say, man, that guy's like, he's got it together. Uh, am I wrong in that? Or was that not the case? Uh, uh, I was younger and less wise. Um, I was still semi in shape, but back at that point, it was when I was really starting to dive into fitness. So um, I wasn't out of shape, but I wasn't in shape either. Gotcha. Well, I guess either way, someone might have looked at you and seen this this young man and not necessarily thought that he was going through what he was going through. And uh, for anybody listening, you know, I've been in a place like that. Chris has been in a place like that. And I think there's so much power in just reaching out to people, being genuine, being there, giving people space. Um, and you never know what a random message a random reaching out with encouragement, what that could do for somebody. So if you're listening, I mean, I would just encourage anybody to pause this, honestly, just right now, pause it and send somebody that you haven't talked to in a long time, just an encouraging message. Just say, say hello and let them know that you're thinking of them and then resume. Okay. We're back. Uh, Chris, so you guys get through that season of life. You have your first child. Are you guys still in Hawaii when that happens? Yeah. Still in Hawaii for, Oh man, I can't even remember how old we, we, she was when we left, but yeah. We okay. Left so, so you're raising a daughter in Hawaii. You're working. Is your wife back to work at any point or is she full-time mom at this point? She's been stay at home ever since. Wow. Okay. So then take us through kind of the transition back to the continental United States. Do you guys come right back to Texas? Right. To yeah, Texas? So, so we went from Hawaii to, to San Antonio, um, and we were only in San Antonio for a year. So uh, my position in San Antonio was to be a general's aide. So I was like a personal assistant to a general. Um, and then for, I did that for a year and we traveled three or four days a week, every week for an entire year, pretty much um, all well. My wife is raising our daughter and then she's pregnant with the next one. So 
can imagine how she felt. Um, she's the champion, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure for, for both of you, that had to be extremely difficult when, when you're gone on those trips for work, what are some of the things that you're struggling with as a husband and as a father? Just missing out on all the development stages, really. Um, knowing that I'm not there and like, even, I mean, we, we, we took the assignment understanding that it was just going to be a, a year where I might have to just suck it up and we're just going to drive through it um, together. And yeah, just going through that, it was challenging because the hours we were together um, were very limited. So I had a leader once tell me that he can't always guarantee me the quantity of time that I can be with my family, but I can guarantee the quality of time that's with my family. So that kind of stuck with me. Oh, wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. It, is that something that sticks with you to this day now that you're, it seems like you're, you're home more often? Yeah. Um, it, and I'm definitely home more often in the, the challenge. I mean, I'm busy getting two master's degrees. So I often find myself talking to my wife, like, Hey, I'm sorry that I've been up in my room studying. Uh, I feel really bad. She said, you know, don't worry about it. You're home more than you've ever been home. Um, and, but I just think back to another kind of saying is there's a difference between being present and presence. So mm. like you could be present and just be there and on your phone and you're hanging out and your kids notice you're there. And then there's presence where you're actively involved and you're engaging and you're making a difference in the lives. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I almost see a parallel to when you guys were in Hawaii and you started volunteering at church and getting more involved. And I think when, and I could speak to this from personal experience, but when people are going through really hard things, there's this craving for connection and craving for, for true presence. And when you're able to be in the moment, all those future worries and all those past anxieties can kind of melt away, at least for that moment in time. And I wonder, is that something that you've noticed in your life and or have actively pursued presence in the hard times? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, one thing I'll say about it is just like doing that and being selfless and giving back to other people, you know, um, because if I'm struggling, but I can still make a difference in somebody's life, like that kind of ta helps take away all the anxiety, all the frustration, all the tension that's going on in my life. So. All right, we got to break this down because this is that's that's a really powerful concept. Where did that come from for you? Have you always been like that? Uh, my my siblings would probably tell you no. <laughs> I'm the baby, so I'm the selfish one. Um, no, but I don't. It came sometime in between once I got to Hawaii and I started like really serving in the church and leading soldiers um, for real and up until now, it's just kind of grown and evolved. And like my urge to do that just, or like, I just crave to do it. Selfless service is like one of my big core values. So. Yeah, that really resonates with me. Now I can't remember if I've talked about this on this podcast yet. Um, excuse me if you're listening and you've heard this, but when I was in high school, I started a club called life's not fair. And looking back, uh, the branding of the club definitely could have been a little bit more intentional. I think people just thought I was complaining about stuff, but really the whole tagline was life's not fair, but it could always be worse. And the whole point was whatever it is that we're struggling with. And, and I grew up in an upper middle class, predominantly white neighborhood in the middle of New Jersey. Um, whatever we're struggling with, uh, someone always has it worse. And so instead of focusing on, on what's wrong with our lives, what's hard in our lives, let's go help the people who are struggling even more, who are facing hardship that we can't even imagine what it feels like. And uh, we did some really cool stuff while I was in high school. And, you know, that spirit has stayed with me to this point and hearing you talk about it, uh, it just it just really resonates. And so I guess for you, what does that look like in life right now um, as you're kind of being a father, pursuing the master's degrees, working? How do you find time to be selfless during all of that? <laughs> yeah, um, really just trying to be involved in helping any way I can with um with my other peers in my class. Um, Cause one of the classes we're going through is like a quantitative methods research and math heavy. And I love math. So a lot of people struggle with it. So I try to help, um, but I still do volunteer at church on top of that. So I play on the worship team. And then I started helping out with the, the campus support, which is like the security 
team also um, and just trying to get involved in the local community any way we can really. Two questions for you. One, what do you play in the worship band? And two, do you sleep? Uh, I do sleep. <laughs> uh, I know you'd imagine the three kids, I wouldn't get much sleep, but I, I get enough sleep and I play a uh, guitar right now. I just play acoustic, but um, just transitioning to play some electric as well in the future. Okay. That's awesome. A man of many talents. I love it. Well, to transition the conversation just a little bit, let's talk about the hardest thing that you've ever pursued on purpose. And a lot of what we talked about so far has been the result of things that more or less were not in your control after they happened. But what is the hardest thing that you, Chris, have ever pursued on purpose? And why have you done that? All right. I got two separate ones. Perfect. Okay. So the first one obviously is joining the military. So uh, before I joined the military and all throughout you know, my childhood, I was overweight, like extremely overweight. So uh, when I graduated from high school, I'm, I'm about five, eight and a half, five, nine on a good day. Uh, I weighed about 230 and that, that was not, I was not muscular. I wasn't athletic or anything. So, um, but I had to lose weight to join the military and then joining the military I was 18 years old. No skills. I'd never really been outside of Washington or my community. Um, so it just getting out there and being on my own and trying to figure out life as an 18 year old kid by myself um, was interesting. So um, that would probably be the hardest like mental kind of challenge I've been through. And then physically, uh, the first marathon I ever did, um, it was kind of one of those things where I'd been talking about doing a marathon for so long, so long. Uh, one day I just signed up out of the blue for a random trail marathon because I love running on trails. I didn't look at the course map and it turns out there was about a mile of elevation change throughout the entire duration of the marathon. So it was like 5,000 or 5,500 feet of elevation. Um, and it was in November in Seattle area. So it was like 32 degrees and raining. And uh, I suffered through that, but it was the greatest experience. Wow. Well, let, let's start with 18-year-old Chris, uh, okay. and we'll break each one down just a little bit because they sound unique. Uh, so 18 years old, you're coming down to Texas, right? I went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for that. Okay, so you're going to Missouri, 18 years old, new environment, more or less on your own, figuring things out. What were some of the struggles that you went through during that chapter of life? Uh, physically, a lot. You know, I, I told myself I had one goal the entire time physically was to just not stop running. It didn't, it didn't matter how slow I was running. Just don't walk. That was my goal. Um, but then uh, growing up uh, kind of like you, like middle class, no worries. Um, but it was all like minded people or like there, I lacked a lot of diversity growing up. Um, and just getting exposed to that was completely different basic training. You're in a bay with a whole bunch of people from all different backgrounds. Um, and it was, it was a shock, but it was the coolest thing ever because um, a lot of my preconceived notions going into that from my family, uh, the way my family behaved and talked about other people, uh, which wasn't great. And so I learned for myself that everybody's amazing. Tell, tell me more about that. But before you, before you elaborate, I just want to highlight another example of how struggle and adversity and hardship and challenge can bring people together, even people who are on the surface, very, very different. But you said you found out that everybody's awesome. But tell me more about that. No, I just, it's, it was so cool learning because um, we had people from all different ages, ethnicities, religious backgrounds, all coming together. Um, and it just, diversity of thought is such a cool thing. Um, mm -hmm. And just learning from other people and like, no matter how different you are, there's, there's always something you can find that's the same or that it's a commonality between people. Uh, and I, I don't think enough people realize that you just got to open up and sure enough, someone's been through a similar experience and you can coalesce around that. That's exactly why I am doing this podcast, you know, and I think the the commonality that I hope this podcast brings out is just that everybody struggles, right? Life is hard. We all face adversity and a lot of it we, we can't control. 
but the way that humans feel, the way that humans are resilient, you know, X, Y, and Z, you can go on and on and on. We're all at our core, very, very similar when it comes to how struggle affects us and how struggle has the potential to bring strength out of us. Um, so I think it's really cool that you highlighted that. And a question for you that might seem a little off topic, but I think is important. If somebody were living in you know, a physical bubble where they're surrounded by very you know, like-minded, similar looking people, what would your best advice be to somebody who wants maybe a little bit more diversity and or is even scared of diversity? What would you say to that person? Oh, man. Uh, Tough question. I mean, there's a lot of historical references you could give to, to countries or nations that failed to expand their thought or um, that just it is not when you lack diversity of thought, there's no room to grow. So you have to get outside of your little bubble, your little network, um, and just whether or not you believe or um, totally buy into what other people have to say, just expanding your knowledge um, makes you more well-rounded as a person. And you might find an idea that you just never thought of before, which I often had people give me great ideas. Mm. I'm not that smart. <laughs> Uh, you could have fooled me. Well, so we're back at basic training, right? You're making friends, you're, you're finding camaraderie there as you go through hard things. At what point, and maybe it didn't at all, but at what point did things start to smooth out a bit um, and you felt like you were finding a rhythm? Uh, I don't know. I was just trying to survive at that point. Uh, to be honest, I was just, I don't think I really found a rhythm until oh man probably i don't know are you still, still looking, looking for it? it yeah no i found a, i found a rhythm I, I i don't know i just it's tough because i can't pinpoint an exact spot where i found a rhythm yeah yeah well tell, tell me where wife to be honest that's what i was gonna ask yeah tell me about that meeting uh well actually we went to high school together um but we didn't really talk in high school uh reconnected on Facebook. I had been going through some relationship stuff, whatever. And I was, what was me on Facebook, young, immature me. And she reached out and sent me a message. And then we kind of connected and I was about to go on leave to come back home. So we met up when I came back home and then the rest is history. That's awesome. All right. So that happens. And then we're going to fast forward a little bit to the marathon. So marathon with a mile of elevation is absolutely no joke uh what what happened on that day oh i was scared that's what happened um no i so i i chose to do a marathon where i had no support or anything like that it was just me um my wife then she was my girlfriend at the time um she was working so she wasn't there i was just kind of out there by myself uh and i just kind of told myself you know, the same thing I told myself that basic training is just, just don't stop. It wasn't just don't walk because I knew I was going to get tired enough to walk up a hill, but um, just don't stop. Just keep moving forward. You can do this. It's been a goal. You're capable. You're confident. You can do it. So in, in the race, right. And I understand that mindset very well, but in the race and in any endurance event, whether it's a marathon, a triathlon, ultra marathon, or just life, there are doubts that can creep in. And I'm sure in a 26.2 mile race with that much elevation, there are moments of doubt. Did you have any, any periods of time where you were like, I just got to, I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, not fully. I can't do this anymore, but just, man, this really hurts a lot. And I'm, I'm suffering. Uh, it, there was definitely points, especially when I'm climbing the Hills where I'm just like, this is, this is awful. This is exhausting. But then, you know, there's that little glimmer of hope when you're like, okay, well, I'm going up a hill. So it has to stop or go downhill at some point. So there's hope. That's a, that's a, another parallel to life. And actually I was having a conversation on the other podcast that I, I co-host the pursuit podcast. We had a guest on from Canada and at the end of the podcast, we asked him if he could share one truth with the world, what would it be? And he wanted to share a quote. And I think we've all heard, or most of us have heard the saying, this too shall pass. And he said, that's actually not the whole thing. And I was 
surprised. And he said, the whole thing is this shall pass and this too shall pass. Meaning the good times will pass and the bad times will pass. (laughs) And just like the elevation gain and then elevation drop in the marathon you did in life, there are ups and downs, highs and lows, uh, ebbs and flows, and they all pass. Um, that's, that's just what happens. And sometime and sometime in the future, we will all just pass and we'll be gone and life moves forward. And I think there's a beautiful analogy there. And so for you, Chris, when you were at the top of the elevation and you were on your way back down, I'm assuming there was a sense of relief for you. Yeah. A lot, right? a lot of relief. Have you experienced similar moments in life? those turning points where you've just climbed up the proverbial hill a mile up and you get to the point where you can look forward and now say, all right, I have a little bit of of downhill ahead of me. Oh yeah. I would say that. um, So I just came before I started this um, program I'm in right now, I was in command uh, company command. So I was responsible for like 70 odd people um, in a medical company. So I worked at a small hospital really. And it was just, in charge of all the soldiers there going through COVID and just trying to embrace the suck, man, and endure through that. Um, and then, you know, when I officially passed the torch, it was kind of like the let a sigh of relief out and like, okay, we accomplished a mission. Now let's take a breather for a little bit. Let's take some time off, refocus, get ready for the next thing. Yeah. And you, you mentioned a phrase there that I would love for you to break down even a little bit more because I think it's a, it's a military thing or uh, embrace the suck is something that I've heard multiple times, all from people who have served. And thank you for your service, by the way. Um, to you, what does embrace the suck really mean? Um, it, it just means, uh, you know, not getting so overwhelmed when things are hard, right? Um, there we go through so much and just finding a network of people to kind of bring together um and share that suck with really helps you get through it um and understand that it's not gonna last forever that you got to find the silver lining um so embrace it know that while it sucks you're gonna learn something through it you're gonna get through it um and just try to make the best out of it as you can because you can't do anything else. Yeah, yeah. I guess, right, time's going to pass either way, whether you stop and then continue on or whether you just continue on. So you might as well just go. And I think you also touched on something that really means a lot to me is that we learn when things are hard. And that's just a place where we grow, just like our muscles grow in the gym when we fight against resistance. The same thing happens in life. And I think it's really beautiful. And so as we shift this conversation just a little bit, The podcast is called the Project Endure Podcast. So I want to ask you, Chris, what does the word endurance mean to you? Oh, it means a lot. Um, So uh, thinking reminds me of scripture. Hmm. So running a race with endurance because endurance uh, produces um, perseverance and perseverance produces hope. So just knowing um, that... uh, you know, um, sorry, I'm trying to find the right words here. Uh, just knowing that you can get through it. Um, if you can endure long enough, um, that you're going to be okay. Right. So there's, that's the hope, right? It's not, it's not meant to, to harm you. It's meant to make you better. You just got to get through it. Um, yeah. And then it produces character, right? So the strength of your character gets tested when you go through, things that you have to endure. So um, that helps you kind of find yourself in all of it. In episode number nine, Andrew Russell also referred back to Romans five, three through five. Um, You know what you just said there. And I think it's a really important point, even for people who might not share the same faith is just that when we go through hard things, it's, it's really refining us. And what you said, took it a step further. It's really just exposing who we are deep down inside and uh, it's, it's really a cool concept to think that really we get to shine the brightest when it's darkest around us. 
And it's really hard to want to shine when it feels like the whole world is dark around us. And this is something that Nick Bear has spoken on recently. But just the fact that if you're in a dark room and there's a light that goes on, everybody in that room is going to look at that light. And some people are going to want to follow it and some people are going to want to shut it off and, and keep everything dark. And if you're the one with the light, you just have to trust that people who need it are going to follow you. And no matter how dark it is, you have to continue to light that path. And I think it's a really beautiful thing, what you're doing, um, how you're leading by example as a husband, as a father, uh, in, your, in your job as a student getting two master's degrees and you're pushing forward and enduring through all of that. And, you know, you're young, it's just the beginning. So you've got a lot of life ahead of you. And the question now that I want to shift to is as you look ahead, what's next for you on the path of endurance? What's the next hard thing that's in your way that you're going to conquer? Uh, so I'm doing the going more marathon for that. Um, I'll see you there. Yeah. I'm just, that's a training run for me. So I'm not trying to kill myself. And, and then in March, I'm doing a 50 K a trail 50 K here in San Antonio. So that'll be nice, but, um, more broad moving to Washington, back up to Washington in the summertime for my next position. So switching into the healthcare admin field, um, which is not something I have a lot of experience in. So, just trying to um, be resilient during that transition um, and learn as much as I can uh, so I can set myself up for whatever the next chapter of my life is, uh, which I don't know. You know, I've been in the army 16 and a half years, so it's coming up to the twilight zone. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. So you guys, as you move back up to Washington and you enter this, uh, this space that you're not necessarily feeling a hundred percent confident or strong in yet, what are some of the things that you're telling yourself or what are some of the things that you would tell yourself if you just got to that point where you just thought, man, I don't belong here. Um, what's the self-talk that has to happen there? Cause I would imagine you've been at that point throughout your 16 and a half years in the army. Yeah, uh, I would say stick to the basics, stick, stick to yourself, remember your core values. Um, and for me, that's integrity, selfless service and faith. And um, God wouldn't have put me here if, if I wasn't meant to be used for something, right? So um, my old boss used to say, uh, grow where you're planted. So yeah, I'm just going to get there and I'm going to grow one way or the other and um, take a little pruning here and there and just try to continue to grow and be the best person I can be just generally be the best person to, to those around me. Uh, now you're speaking my language. Anytime you use a plant analogy, I'm all over it. Uh, but before I go there, I was listening to another podcast where I heard the phrase recently, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And whether again, whether or not faith is, is your thing, as you listen to this, I think it's just this trust that you have to believe everything is happening on purpose. Life is happening for you and not to you. And it's really easy to say that when things are good or when you're looking back at some struggles that have passed and now you're, you're beyond that. But I think it's really challenging to embrace while you're in the middle of it. But I just want to reiterate that everything is happening for you, not to you. And then to talk more about plants and seeds, uh, my favorite quote, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. And that's by Christine Kane. And I would even argue that if you want to grow, you sometimes need to be put underground and you need to get some, some dirt put on top of you and you need to get you know, bruised up a little bit. Uh, and it takes a lot of work beneath the surface before you could break through. Uh, so for anybody struggling out there, uh, if you still feel like you haven't been able to break through, maybe you're just still building roots and you have to trust that process. Um, and so Chris, as we begin to shift the conversation uh, toward the final question, I wanna prepare you by saying, this question is something that I really think has the potential to change somebody's life who's listening to this podcast, who's potentially in a dark spot. And as someone who aspires to be a father someday, I want to ask you this question with a little bit of a twist. So normally I would ask the question, what is one message that you have for someone in the audience who's going through a challenging season of life, who's listening to this podcast right now? And I, I want you to keep that in mind, but I'm going to ask you one day, one of your children is really, really struggling. They're in a super, super dark place. 
what is the message that you have for your child at that point in life? And just imagine that they're listening to this podcast, however many years in the future that you want to tell them this. Oh man, that would be extremely difficult. I never want to see that. I know it's going to happen, but um, I don't think my message would really honestly change. Right. So um, last week or so I was listening to you and Will Thomas, um, who's I met in person and he's a really awesome, really awesome dude. Um, but you asked him that question and then immediately it just triggered me. So, and then I posted on my um, Instagram, so I'm just going to read it verbatim if yeah. that's okay. But it says a message of hope endure every single second of every single day. Someone is going through the hardest thing they've ever gone through. And that person may be you right now. You may feel alone. Uh, like nobody understands your pain or your hurt, but I promise you that you are not alone and that some people have experienced exactly what you're going through. And I don't say this to downplay your hurt, your pain, your suffering. It is real and is valid. But I say this to say every single second of every single day, someone is overcoming the hardest thing they've ever gone through and you will too. And then remember this saying, no matter how hard it is or how hard it gets, I'm going to make it. If you had a mic, we would drop it right now. And that would be the end of this podcast. But that is incredibly powerful. And I remember seeing that. Um, and I was wondering if you were going to bring that back up. And I'm glad that you did. And I think it's a message that, to be honest, we all need to hear whether or not we are that person going through the hardest thing of our life, or we're riding the highest high of our life. Because it could be really easy to forget what that feels like. And I think when we become too detached uh, for, or too distanced from our dark periods, our dark seasons, our dark times, it could be almost dangerous because we can lose that empathetic connection that we have to other human beings. And, you know, like I alluded to earlier in the podcast, you never know what someone else is going through. Um, I experienced it, right? I was the kid in graduate school who was, you know, getting good grades, making everybody laugh, um, in shape, healthy, whatever. But on the inside, I was absolutely falling apart and nobody knew it except me. And so I would just echo what you said, Chris, and to anybody who's listening, just reach out to that person in your life who you haven't talked to in a while. Uh, if you're passing somebody in the street, just flash them a smile. You know, even if you have a mask on, people can tell that you're smiling, hold a door for somebody, do something nice. And you never know who's, whose day you can change or whose life you can change with something small like that. So you just trigger something uh, is that you have to intentionally look for relationships too, especially when you're in those dark spots and you have to find people who will call you out, who, mm. who aren't just going to tell you what you want to hear. You have to build relationships. Um, and so like one of the big ones for me was joining a men's group at church mm. where like once you establish enough of a relationship, they just, they can tell when you're off. You have to have that kind of, that, that sense where people will be like, Hey, there's, I haven't heard from you in a couple of days, what's wrong or your tone or your face looks like, why does your face look like that? Uh, so, um, and that's challenging for me because, you know, a lot of my struggle going through it and working through it is just, I don't, I don't talk about my emotions that much and I still don't, but I'm getting better at it. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because this was also part of a conversation I was having recently was just the fact that it's really challenging to take ownership in life. It's hard, right? Taking ownership means that there's nobody else to blame but you for the things that go wrong and for the things that go right. But accountability and having people in our lives who can tell us how it is, show us some tough love and just ask hard questions and not just brush things off and say, oh, yeah, I know you're just having a hard day. It's okay. You'll, you'll get them tomorrow. Um, sometimes we need that, but sometimes we need somebody to say like, no, Joe, you're making an excuse right now. And, and I need you, I know you could do better and I need you to do better. And I guess for you, Chris, how, what would you say would be a, a good way for somebody to find that if they have no idea where to start and they have nobody in their life who fits that mold right now. I mean, obviously for you, it's a men's group at church and I would be, I'm biased. I think social media can serve that uh, if you intentionally seek out the right people, but do you have any suggestions for somebody who's looking for that accountability, but doesn't know where to go and maybe is scared about it? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I'd recommend going to church and finding a group or um, just even one of your friends that you currently have, there's got to be something um, or someone in your life that 
you feel comfortable enough to talking to. And then like, don't just come right out and spill all the beans and like, Hey, I'm, I'm going through all this sort of stuff and lay it on them, but maybe something small to see how they respond to it. And, and once you realize that getting that little bit off your chest, isn't the end of the world. And then, then you start building that relationship more, or, I mean, I don't think social media is a bad spot. Like you and I have connected very much and I would trust you enough to be like, Hey man, I'm going through this. Can you help me out? You know? Yeah. And likewise. And, and the other thing I would add there too, that I'd be curious to get your opinion on is it's hard to ask for that kind of help. And it's hard to ask for someone to hold you fully accountable. But at the same time, I also find it challenging at times to hold other people fully accountable. And that's part of my job as a coach is to make sure that people are doing what they say they're doing and to help bring out the best in people. And that requires me to ask some hard questions and to challenge people. And I'm sure as a leader, um, through your 16 and a half years in the army, as a husband, as a father, you faced that dilemma on multiple occasions, I would imagine. So I guess, do you have, do you have a hard time asking hard questions of other people at this point in time? No. Um, and I would just say that everybody's fallible. So yeah, while you, while you are trying to hold people accountable, like there's just that level of humanity that you have to expect is that some people, some people are just going to make mistakes or they're not going to fully, you, you don't know what's going on in their life because you're not monitoring them 24 seven as a coach, especially via distance, you're just kind of taking the feedback they get based off of whatever metrics you're asking and then trying to analyze it. Um, but just having that human, uh, the empathetic um, connection and um, just giving as much grace as you can while still being, while still trying to hold them accountable. Because if you try to crack the whip too much, you know, it's just going to send them in the exact opposite direction. So. Yeah. It's this challenging balance of, uh, of pushing enough, but knowing when to back off, um, knowing when to really challenge somebody and knowing when to give space and grace um, and it's tough. And I don't know if it's, if there's a one size fits all, there's probably not. And it's different for everybody, but I appreciate the way you do that. Uh, you know, if I want people to go connect with you, I'm going to send them to your Instagram link down in the description, Chris Piontek on Instagram. And is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners, Chris? No, I just, thank you for having me on. It's always good to, to connect with you, man. Absolutely, Chris. I am uh, so glad we made this happen and I can't wait for the world to hear this. Uh, I will see you in a few weeks at the marathon. And until then, just keep up all the great work. Sir. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. Oh, and one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.